Minnesota, small mountain, wouldn't associate that with ski racing, but I was kind of looking into it. And there's actually been like some pretty successful ski racers that have come out of not only Minnesota, but the, the program that you worked with. Like h how? <laughs> <You know>? Wow. <laughs> What's going on, everyone? I'm Nils Mendick, and this is the Backcountry Podcast, a show aimed at providing insight into the outdoor industry by interviewing people who operate within it. Today, I'm going to be talking with Lauren Samuels. Lauren's journey started with ski racing on a small 175-foot resort in Minnesota. In high school, she joined the U.S. ski team and later raced for the University of Utah. Met with the stark reality of diversity issues in the ski industry, Lauren has gone on to immerse herself in solutions while also operating as an associate category manager for Solomon. Lauren, what up? How What's are up? you? Good. How are you? I'm doing well. Just kind of settling into the transition of seasons right now. I woke up this morning and actually had to close the windows in our house because it was too crispy and I almost put a sweater on. Wow. Yeah. That I, I like to hear that. Yeah. It was a really, really thrilling morning. <laughs> <laughs> Same down in Salt Lake, but it was a little smoky. Mm. But yeah, I was surprised when I walked out the door. I was like, oh, do I need a sweater? I don't know. I know. Yeah. But I, that, I, I embrace it. That the time of year, everybody's thinking about it. <laughs> so I kind of want to talk about your ski racing days and kind of how that shaped your introduction to the outdoor sports industry and your perspective of it. Like, Let's get into it. What was okay. that like growing up on a 175 foot resort in Minnesota? We don't take it for granted when we get to go out west. <laughs> um, I don't know. Minnesota's cold. It's snowy, and really, you you make a decision at a pretty young age, or really, your parents kind of make this decision for you: of Are we going to be the the family who like hibernates through the winter because it's really cold, or are we going to embrace it and like do some sports in the winter? Um, a lot of people play basketball, tons of people play hockey, and my parents were skiers, and so we skied. So I learned how to ski in my front yard when I was two years old, or maybe less than two on the front yard, and um, I just fell in love with it. It was a family sport, and my brother eventually started ski racing, so I'm the little sister who, you know, obviously just wants to do whatever he does, so. Yep, yeah, I can relate. My uh, my brother started snowboarding and competing first, and then I, like, followed in his his footsteps. You got to like, it's funny how that's always the case, right? You're just like trying to tag along with like the older sibling. Yeah. I mean, thankful for bigger siblings, I guess. Or yeah. I should say older, older. siblings who yeah. come before you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so then were um, your parents are both skiers then as well? Oh yeah. My mom was a lifelong skier or is a lifelong skier. Her family all skis and my dad went, learned how to ski, I think in middle school. Okay. So yeah. That's cool. And you know, Minnesota, small mountain, wouldn't associate that with ski racing, but I was kind of looking into it and there's actually been like some pretty successful ski racers that have come out of not only Minnesota, but the, the program that you worked with. Mm -hmm. um, like how? <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> well, <laughs> how is, if you're still ski racing a few years later, um, you for sure, you have to love the sport to do it. There's some other places like maybe out here in Utah where kind of everyone gets in, gets put into like ski racing or now free ride or freestyle or snowboard. Um, in the Midwest, like you really got to love it if you're going to keep doing it because it is cold um, and it's just not as well known and it's not as, I don't know, glorified, but yeah, it's definitely more of like a fringe activity. It seems yeah. for, for like what the norms are in that region. Yeah. And then we just get tons of repetition because it is 175 feet of vert. And we just like take a bunch of laps every night. We would train at night. So I go to school. Dad would pick me up from school, drive to the hill, which was only like a 15 minute drive. And mind you, it's called a hill, not the mountain. And I don't know how many runs we'd get in an evening, but practice was like two hours, two and a half hours and get tons of laps. It was a pretty, uh, like bad snow, like icy. I'm, I'm trying to think, I because I grew up competing on the East Coast and mm -hmm. there was this, you know, maybe the, the snowboarding's equivalent to ski racing as far as you're like, a way to build out your foundation is half pipe riding. Yeah. And especially half pipe riding on the East Coast, essentially you're just learning how to ride in like a 
half pipe of pure ice. Yeah, it's you know? fast and hard. And it's very fast. You learn yeah, quickly. super fast. You learn quick. High yeah, consequences. Yeah, you, learn, you understand how to turn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Was that kind of the case as well where you were? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely part of it in mm-hmm. the Midwest. It's typically icier, maybe not as much as your East Coast, but mm-hmm. icier, colder. The temps just stay cold, so the snow stays hard. Yeah. When I moved out West was one of the first times I realized that, like, having new snow affects training you know in the midwest it i mean it snows but one we'd train at night so there was like time to people would ski and like ski off the fresh snow and then out here we're like slipping all day you got to prep the course and yeah so we didn't we didn't deal with that much in in minnesota which i guess is a pro yeah a con of like we don't really learn how to powder ski there but no you don't need a big mountain and tons of vert to like get repetition to learn how to turn like you said and do tons of drills i think that's kind of like overseen in the ski and snow sports industry because especially the reps thing that you're talking about like most skill-based sports honestly anything in life right like you just have to get the reps in and do it to learn and there's actually um a resort in Minnesota that's really popular with snowboarding. That's just a rope tow. It's Highland Hills. Highland Hills. That's where I grew up. Okay, cool. Yeah, all right, so sweet. All the yeah, same park thing. Then kids were right next. To so me. it's that's so <laughs> ironic because yeah, with the with the snowboard scene there, like it, a it is like just known around the world by mm-hmm. snowboarders as being like a place to visit and yeah. to check out, which you wouldn't really anticipate. <laughs> no. And B, it's where a lot of like some of the most prevalent urban street snowboarders have either moved to or grew up riding at. And then, mm-hmm. you know, it's just because of like the mileage you get on that yeah. like specific type of terrain. Yeah. That's so funny. Cause yeah, I grew up at Highland. That's my home hill. Okay, cool. The race hill or the training hill is like right next to the park. Uh-huh. Um, there's like a few trees, bushes separating okay. them. Yeah, totally. And sometimes when we were young in junior race and stuff, like, we would go hit the park yeah. after training and yeah. the rope toe was always really scary. Like I'm I perfectly capable of yeah. like getting on a rope toe. That was uh-huh. fine. But the snowboarders would like come in and like sometimes take us out, hit us so hard. I had a lot of friends get like cut on the rope toe. <laughs> I bet it's, yeah, I bet there's kind of a, it seems like there's a scene there. I've never been, but like also, I mean, for anyone that's like maybe not entirely familiar you know you say rope toe and it's actually it's not like there's not a, a handle that comes no, out to grab it's not, it's not like not, a j bar it's, it's not a j bar it's not like a t bar it's not a palma it is straight up this like two inch diameter yeah woven rope that's just like getting whipping sp- whipping <laughs> it's going fast so you like physically have to just like grab onto this rope and like you know and I, you have to know like how to you like can't cinch. grab too yeah. fast yeah, you have or to else like- your arms will rip out. <laughs> so you have to like slowly engage. Yeah. Just like a chairlift, I guess. Yeah. Detachable quads. Totally. But yeah. So the you have to wear the it. choppers so you don't ruin your nice mittens. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's funny. <laughs> okay. So then, you know, you're, you're at Highland Hills. You're, uh, you're skiing your heart out every night. And then uh, it seemed like in high school you joined the U.S. Ski uh, development team for a period of time. Yeah. How did that, like, where did that opportunity come from? And then let's kind of get into like what that, what that was like for you. Uh, it came from my results really. Cool. Um, I think the previous year end of the season was J2 nationals and I had some standout performances there and yeah, I got named to the U S ski team at 15 years old, which is pretty young. Yeah. That, that is pretty. Yeah. Yeah. So I was named with a group of eight eight total girls around the same age. And Mm -hmm. yeah, I was on the D team for one year and then eventually got cut, dropped from the team and then was like in this transition and figured it out and moved to Utah, came out here to go to a ski academy to finish high school because I still was in school. Okay, yeah. um, From Minnesota. Yeah. yeah. That's, I mean, uh, I guess A, it is cool how, especially in like the racing sports, you know, there's like, your time is what matters, right? Mm -hmm. There's like such like a cut dry result versus like I I came from like a competitive freestyle background and there's just always like so much nuance to try, you know, you're you're getting judged, right? So you're like, 
Yeah. How, how, wait, why didn't I get scored better? Like, how do I get scored better? You know, there's, there's a lot more like, I don't know. I think there's something cool to be said about just that, like almost like cut and dry, no yeah. BS factor with racing that you like put it out on the line and those are your results. Yeah. The numbers, like numbers don't the lie. clock doesn't lie. Yeah. There's still like the guess of you're like, what the, I had such a good run. Like I felt so good and uh-huh. training I've been you know, maybe beating these people yeah. and then like race run, race day comes something and you're like, what happened? And yep. sometimes it's obvious. Sometimes, you know, like I'll totally. do one turn. Yeah. Sometimes it's the wax. Like, oh my God. I mean, that's I a legitimate like, thing. People joke about like, oh, you can blame it on the wax. And I'm like, yeah, no, you, you actually totally can. can. Totally. Especially in I, speed. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I spend for some context, I'm like, you know, half pipe snowboarding, it's very, um, you need like a very well-tuned snowboard maybe yeah. as opposed to like a, a rail snowboard, you know? So like always having my edges dialed, always having like the wa- like the right wax on, like all those things and kind of getting into like the science of wax. And then, you know, taking that, I do more like, um, I'll still do like bank slalom races, like kind of like grassroots, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. simple events. And yeah, same deal. Like everyone nerds out about the wax yeah. so much. <laughs> uh, Seems crazy, but seems crazy but it's it's legit trust (laughs) us so then what was i mean you know you're joining like the u.s team coming from minnesota and you're you know did you move to park city for that year as a 15 year old or you just came out and visited for some camps like it just it sounds intimidating yeah it definitely is (laughs) Um, (laughs) like how was that was that like 15 years old and i I was already traveling a lot for the sport but it's different when you take it to another level and you're now working with a new coach that you've never met before mm-hmm. day one. You have new teammates um, who are maybe a couple years older than you, maybe have a lot of medals or accolades. You're like, damn, yeah. like that was the girl I was looking up to the last few years. And now she's yeah. like, we got to share a room all season. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. Um, was there like imposter syndrome kind of in that situation where you're like, wait, what am I doing here? Why am I like, what? Why There's me? definitely moments of that. Yeah. Sometimes you show up and you're like, yeah, I got this. You're confident and you know why you're there. Mm -hmm. And often you have to remind yourself, like, I deserve this. I was named the team. But then you sometimes get extra, a new start or you get to go race in Europa Cup in Europe and you're in a whole new, like literally a different world. Yeah. Everyone's, even the starter is like speaking a different language to you. Totally. do I go now? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so that's when I started to feel like imposter syndrome for sure. Totally. Yeah. And I mean, like you're 15, like, you know, you're still like, you don't realize it at the time, but again, in, you know, retrospect, I think back to having similar experiences when I was at that age, like I moved out when I was 14. Right. And like, yeah, looking back at it now, I was like, God, I was like a child trying to navigate, like totally. kind of like some legit, you know, like, social life structures moments. and life moments yeah. and like you know what felt like significant stressors and stuff like that yeah I mean that's a big part of it and I'm I'm close with my family I have an older brother close with my parents but when you're on the road all the time and I'm sure you get this sense like you're who you're traveling with becomes your family totally and my parents would be like you're not calling us like is everything yeah. okay and yeah we all quickly agreed and learned that like no word is a good word. Like they'll know if something's up, if something's not great. Yeah. But especially back then, like, I mean, of course we had cell phones, but it wasn't, it's not as easy to like FaceTime and whatever. Yeah. So you just resort to the people who are around you. So like these teammates are now your kind of your sisters. These coaches are, yes, they're coaches, but sometimes you find one that's maybe more of a mentor, more of someone you can turn to in hard times. But yeah, uh, I didn't move out at that time, but I did, I was still going to school in Minnesota, my junior year of high school, and I missed 109 days of school to give it context of like, sure, I didn't move out, but I was not 100 days, yeah, 109 (laughs) days away from home. Yeah. Totally. That's a a lot of time. Yeah. For sure. It's crazy. And so you said you were, you did a year with the development team Mm -hmm. and then kind of didn't like meet the marks or something like that after a year and then transitioned to finishing at an academy? Yeah. So, I mean, every year they rename the team and it's based on a different results and 
do you qualify or not? And discretionary, blah, blah, blah. They redid their development program protocol that year as well. So it was like a full refresh. And unfortunately didn't make the cut. Maybe that's a blessing in disguise. I don't know. I don't regret anything. It's just how it is. And so then it was like, all right, it's July. I still have another year of high school. Like I'm not dropping out of school. I already missed 110 days last year. Like, how is this going to work next year? So we like quickly pulled it together and I moved out here, came to Romark Sea Academy in Salt Lake City. And they have a great program that's built into a really strong school, great education. And, um, but there was more support for missing school, which was great. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, I would say it's a blessing in disguise, almost like, I don't know, you can, you see it with plenty of younger athletes, maybe, and especially in the like national team architecture is that like, you almost get pigeonholed and it's, you know, you maybe like, maybe one day you would have gotten the gold medal at the Olympics, right? Because that's kind of the goal with all of those programs yeah, is the like Olympics the is winning, right? Mm -hmm. But then all of a sudden you end up on this like, and you see it happen to people, they're just in this time capsule for five, 10 years and you, you get out of it and you're like, uh oh, uh -oh. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, I don't really have, I'm not really a part of like the full ski culture and community because I was so focused on one area and I, yeah I would say it was a blessing in disguise <laughs> yeah thanks <laughs> um, and no, then, that's definitely part of it and eventually a few years down the road I I started to feel that pigeonholing mm -hmm. and chose to go another way so totally you're spot on <laughs> yeah yeah so then because you went and raced you went and raced for the University of Utah mm -hmm. after high school yep so I took two years off after high school, just ski raced. And I was like kind of half on the US ski team and not like I'd travel with them, go to all the races with them. Those were my coaches, but I didn't have a jacket. Totally. Um, yeah. I didn't have the financial support. It so. is. Yeah. That's like a whole other conversation. Yeah. That, whole that space, other, we don't have to, to go Totally. That way. Yeah. I'm familiar with that, <laughs> with that world. And but it's, so, it's weird. There's a, for anyone listening that's maybe not familiar, it is a, it's just a gray area of like yeah. your involvement as a, as an athlete and, Hopefully you make it, but yeah, there's this uh, like never ending nuance of like, you're in the mix, you're not in the mix, yeah. like kind of getting led on maybe. <laughs> yeah, well, it felt a little bit like that. And then it was like, we want you to go this way specifically in yep. terms of disciplines. Yeah. And I was like, okay with that, but I, I always wanted to go to college, go to continue my education and ski race in college. Yeah. And there's there's timelines again this is super confusing but like NCAA and all yep. these rules and it was like if I'm gonna do that I gotta do it now and I want to do it now so yeah. I'm gonna go that way and it, it all works out and yeah I don't know what people said about it but that doesn't matter yeah like, totally I went that way and then I went to University of Utah and pursued an amazing education and incredible experience as a D1 athlete that's cool yeah. what did you study at the U? athletic training oh, okay yeah there you go pre-med didn't stray too far <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> so it's then only. okay i mean that's even actually more interesting to me because like you know what i kind of want to get into is um eventually you found your your way to solomon and like from college to to working at solomon like was that like a quick transition or time period or like what? No. <laughs> like how did you, I don't know, maybe not to like jump over too much. Yeah, I can try to. History, but like, you know, athletic trainer and then you're, you're in marketing. Yeah, I was going the medical route, athletic training and pre-med and I wanted to go to med school. I had tons of injuries in my time as a ski racer, especially at the U. And I was really drawn towards orthopedic surgery and, and doctors and people who helped athletes get back to where they could be in pre and post surgery or injury, et cetera. So I wanted to do that because I was tied to high performing athletes and, and the sport. And then after school, after taking my MCAT, all that, I kind of, it was weird. I took my MCAT, moved home in like three days back to Minnesota and graduated and everything. And it felt like I finally came up for a breath. And it was like, whoa, who have I been the last like three years of this jam pack, really even last one year trying to do pre-med and did all my prereqs and all that stuff. And I was like, that's not me. That's not who I am. I love to ski. I love to 
a bike, to be outside, to hike, camp, all this stuff. And I was like, when's the last time I did any of those? Oh, like, and it was just this reality check of like, do I want to keep going in this path? It's definitely something that I'm passionate about, but let me take a break here. And I eventually was like, I, I don't want to pursue that. So I went back to coaching or not back, but I went to coach and hmm. kind of give myself time and some time to give back to the sport and like hand down my knowledge and my experience to the next generation of athletes. And then I coached for two years and had some time to reflect on like what I like, what I don't like in life, in jobs and careers and, and pretty honestly, not very quickly <laughs> figured out that like, okay, I love product and, and athletes and anybody can be an athlete no matter what sport you're playing, it doesn't, you don't have to be the top tier. You don't have to be going to the Olympics. Like you said, that was the ultimate, right? That's what it took to win was to have a gold medal at the Olympics. That's not the case. And it was like, okay, I can work on product, help any level of athlete, love this sport, have a great experience being the outdoors. So I eventually found graduate school and wanted to go in product. And so eventually I ended up here at Solomon, but that was quite a few years after graduating undergrad. Yeah, totally. So then you're coaching, you kind of realize you're like, have this draw to, to product and connecting. You know, I I feel like there is something to be said that is for me feels a bit more special maybe than your generic everyday quote unquote product or like selling products to people, whatever that looks like in various ways. But mm -hmm. like in the sports space, it feels special to me because you're like, man, this is like, a good ski or snowboard really like brighten someone's day. Like this is like sick, you know, that like I get to like coordinate and help these people, you know, have a good time or like whatever experience, maybe something that I got to like find in myself, you know, yeah. as, as opposed to just like people like whatever consumerism or like anti-capitalism route, which like yeah. I, I think in that like <laughs> mountain culture age like comes up where you're like I don't need anything I'm fringe but you know to like connect the dots and think yeah like people deserve to have like sweet boots and like a good pair of boots like whether you're just learning how to ski or you're trying to you know do uh, the fastest lap you can at snowbird yeah uh, on a pow day <laughs> like everyone kind of enjoys that right yeah no there's definitely something to be said there and so, so did you go back to, to school then? Yeah, I went to grad school. Okay. University of Oregon. Oh, cool. Yeah. Sports product management. Cool. Yeah. Dang, that's like a very, that sounds pretty... Very niche. Niche. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and that's like a program sweet. that they offer? Yeah. It's out of the Portland campus. So instead of being in Eugene, we were in Portland. Um, I applied before this like COVID thing happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Got in uh, the week that like everything shut down here. Perfect. And they were like, cool. Are you coming or not? And I was like, there's this like thing going on that will we go to school or like, what's the deal? And they're like, we don't know yet, but we'll figure it out. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I want to do this. Why wait? So I ultimately got up, moved to Portland in the middle of COVID and yeah, it was a year and a half program. First year was all virtual or like remote I still lived in Portland but like we could only go on campus certain times and so many people and fully masked and they were really good about trying to maximize our time there even though we had to do it safely and then yeah. and then I interned over the summer after my internship um I was like hey I'll apply to jobs soon because I'm going to graduate in six months or in yeah in March and this job opened and I saw it and it was like this is too early the timing's not perfect but I should probably do it because the job's kind of perfect. So yeah, I got super lucky and got this job and cool. moved here and finished my last term actually remote. <laughs> no way. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Dang. So then what was it like starting at, how was it starting at Solomon? It's kind of your first like, because had you as a ski racer, like had you been very affiliated with brands and like, you know, sales and marketing and all that stuff well, sales and marketing definitely not mm -hmm. not that much tied in with I, I know a ton about product and I knew the importance of product and performance and every half millimeter matters so in that way I was tied in with my own equipment but I wasn't like tied in with any brand sure I was sponsored by brands but they're not looping us in to like product development unless you're at the top tier 
um, which I wasn't. So, yeah. <laughs> That's cool. So then what was that like kind of getting to, you know, almost be like on the other side of the lens starting out at Solomon? It was interesting. A lot of ways I was like, this will be not easy, but like an easier entry um, into the sports product industry versus going into like a sport or an industry that I don't have experience in. It'd be pretty hard to trust myself and like have confidence to speak confidently about any specific gear or, uh, you know, if it was like about climbing, I, I'm not a climber. Yeah. So if someone's like, well, why'd you do this on the climbing shoe? It would just take a lot of research and like, yeah. So like I, I did yeah. bring some confidence into that and like, I can ski. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I can test skis pretty confidently. I'm still always learning, but it made it a little bit easier to transition into my career. And I, I am, or I was pretty emotionally tied to Solomon before. Um, I grew up on Solomon uh -huh. before we stopped bringing race product into the U S. So I was like actually sponsored at a super young age. Shout out to my rep who hooked it up back then. He's actually still working for the brand. No way. Yeah. I just got off the phone with him this morning uh -huh. on my way up here and it's, it's so cool to like see it come full circle. But, um, and my dad before that, before I was born, my dad worked for Solomon. No which way. Which is wild. So that's so crazy. Wow. You, you have like generational yeah i guess skin in the game <laughs> <laughs> i guess so but um it's okay so then like what's your kind of like your official title and what's sort of like right now your your day-to-day -day look like operationally every day is different everyone says that sounds cliche when you're like not working but it is honestly my title is associate manager for the alpine and protective category so i work on all Alpine hard goods, skis, boots, bindings, poles, helmets, goggles. And what does that mean? Associate manager of a category, what? Everything go to market, like setting price lists. What are we selling here? How much are we selling it for? Uh, where are we selling it? What are the key initiatives? What's our new product this year? That's a big part of my job. Then certain times of the year, I'm doing development side, tied in with our global team, the, the true product managers for skis and boots. We bring them over here, we show them our market. What do we need here? We go to shops, we talk to skiers, and we're testing prototype skis <clears throat> on snow a lot, which is sweet. Like people joke like, oh, so you just ski for work? And I'm like, well, actually, yeah. Some days. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's when it's, I think really fun is getting to test stuff and again, like learn all the time. Yes. Yeah. As much as I at least can, ha I have like the sense of this ski feels this way or that way and I can verbalize it, but then talking to the developers and designers and they're able to say like, you're spot on, this is why. And now mm. I'm like learning, okay, that's the difference between like carbon versus flax versus basalt. That's the difference between poplar or caruba. That's the difference between this top sheet material, that top sheet material. So there's always just so much more to learn. <laughs> I mean, that's so cool. Cause like, I would imagine that that like, you know, it seems like you're kind of able to go through, especially with skis, right. And like pass through with like a fine tooth comb, right. Of like what, oh, this is what I'm feeling. This is what the ski is like, all these things. I mean, that's gotta be completely from your racing background, right? Yeah. It, that's how I learn or know the feeling, the sensation. Mm -hmm. Have you kind of ran into like having to try, maybe not remove yourself from like what you would like? Is yeah. this something, you know what I'm kind of getting <laughs> into? Because as a, as a rider, this is something that I've had a, uh, a learning curve with where I'm like, I know exactly what I like and how I would like this board to ride. In, in every scenario, like I know how I want my park board to ride, my pow board, my big mountain board, my, my race board, whatever, like a whole variety. Like mm -hmm. I have a specific idea, but that doesn't really line up with like general consumer, general consumer <laughs> yeah. and what they would want in their park board, carving board, big mountain board. Like yeah. how is, have you had to kind of like reverse engineer, like try to connect the dots there? What's that been like? Yeah, it definitely. <laughs> like, is it viable? Like, is it viable for like a market, right? Yeah. I mean, that's the biggest question. And what I like 
may not be what the next person likes and it's probably probably not what a newer skier wants Mm -hmm. and it's not going to provide them the best experience when they're maybe a a beginner or someone who skis on east coast ice every day and so yes I've had to learn to kind of filter that and like put different hats on and it probably feels pretty fulfilling to be working in a brand that sort of like aligns its values with something that has been important with you in a long time for a long time which is high quality innovative products Mm -hmm. you know is that like was that kind of a lure to go to solomon in the first place yeah i mean that was part of my draw to the brand uh they're known we are known for innovation and we hold ourselves to a very high standard of if we can't provide something different or better for the skier why are we going to bring it to market why are we going to innovate or is that even really truly innovation so that is one big draw to this brand and when you when I got to go to the ADC the NSC Design Center in France for the first time it was like eye opening I'm like this is why I've I've toured that facility (laughs) and it is mind blowing Yeah, like the amount of just all that like especially the racing department too like kind of seeing how like specific they can work everything out but you know I think what's really cool is that you know, like there's something for everyone. It's mm-hmm. not just like a brand for the high performing athlete. It's not just a price point brand that has something yeah. for someone getting into it. It's like, oh, you're new to skiing or snowboarding. Here's like our entry level product. You can trust it. It is really good. Oh, you want to be like the most savage badass at your mountain? Like we have that too. Yeah. You know, don't, we got you covered, right? It's like yeah. there's, they cover, like the brand covers such a swath. Mm -hmm. of like products and sort of the applications of said products. I I don't know. It's like probably intimidating and a lot to manage, I would imagine, for you because, you know, you're not doing like one niche thing. You're trying to like mitigate the whole scale of performance. Yeah. You know, like what's that even like? You just have to like try to spend some time with consumers or in that market, if you may, and like put on that lens of, oh, if I'm a beginner, like I'm going into a rental shop to get skis, what is that experience like? What matters to me? You know, that consumer isn't like, is this boot going to get tight enough and no. be able to transfer my energy from my body yeah, to the snow? Yeah. Like yeah, yeah, that's yeah. totally different. No. So <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a lot to manage, but it's cool. It's fun. It, that's what keeps this job like always changing. And mm-hmm. one thing I think I think is really cool about Solomon is, we don't just innovate for that like top tier performer, like you were saying. Exactly. <laughs> There's ways we can improve skiing experiences for other people who aren't performing at that highest level. And we take that really seriously too. Like we put just as much money into, into innovation and, you know, designing new products for that consumer as much as we do for the top tier. Totally. I mean, yeah. And, you know, you think about it and it's like, how do you know a yeah how do you make the most savage ski ever all right like this is kind of the route we can go but it's just as important to be like how do we make the easiest ski to learn on you know the easiest yeah. snowboard to learn on what's the easiest way to get into your boots like what boots could my mom wear that she won't complain about exactly <laughs> like yeah. so she can just like enjoy her five runs or her afternoon at the resort right mm-hmm. and that that's just as valuable as the person out there trying to like push their limits or push the limits of the sport. Yeah. And a lot of us like core skiers and snowboarders, you forget about those days when you were learning. Cause a lot of us were lucky enough to like grow up skiing and I don't remember what it's like to learn how to put my boots on, you know, like I was two years old and, but there's people who are doing that for the first time ever at an older age and it's completely different. And then you're like, Oh yeah, cool. Okay. That's a new challenge that we can address and try to solve with a new product. So totally let's kind of dive into some specific products that I'm kind of, I'm curious to hear about because I'm, I'm well versed and familiar with the snowboarding side of Solomon. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't, uh, that makes one of us. Yeah, exactly. But then the (laughs) other one of us that's here right now is pretty familiar with the ski side of things. So, First off on the list, I kind of want to talk about the new ultralight touring ski that you guys did with 
Cody Townsend. Mm -hmm. Our QST Echo 106. What's up with that? Why does it exist? Why did he need it? <laughs> well, <laughs> who wants it? Cody's Cody. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> he does cool stuff. Yeah. I and mean, he pushes the boundaries of what skiing is, honestly, and what is skiable, frankly. So I, I guess I wouldn't go quite so far to call it an ultralight touring ski. Mm -hmm. I would say it's a, it's a pretty light touring ski that skis phenomenally well, that you can trust in any conditions on any, you know, pitch or mountain. And so, yeah, it's a lighter version of our QST 106. So we've, we have our kind of and signature hallmark e family of the QST. Yeah. What's up with the QST? I'm not familiar with that. Okay. So we have, that is our, our best selling franchise. It has no metal in it. So it's full wood core. We do, well, I shouldn't say there's no metal. There's no metal running tip to tail. There's metal under the binding. I hope retain binding screws, of course, but it's a, we'll, a full wood core family, a franchise. We go from the QST blank which is a more powder ski, all the way down to a QST 92. So we have the blank, 106, 98, 92. And uh, that's a all-mountain free ride ski. You can ski it anywhere. You can ski groomers. You can ski pow. It is really the hallmark of, of Solomon skis right now. Mm -hmm. and, and are these kind of like the, I guess, like is it just like the higher end, more curated line of skis, right? Because it sounds like they cover like a variety of disciplines still. Yeah, they cover a variety of waist widths or disciplines or skier type and price points, really. Mm -hmm. So it's the pinnacle of our of our ski line right now. We also have like the the stance lineup, which has it's a more traditional build with two sheets of metal in most of the skis. Um, so this is a little bit more playful, fun, free ride oriented, approachable ski, but still like especially the 106 and the blank, like those things you can get so sandy on them and they're stable, but yeah. so we've, there's always been questions like, when are you going to make a, a touring QST ski? And okay. Yeah. That's part of it because the, the shapes are so good, like the profile and the actual side cut shape is just, it's, it's great. So we took what we learned from QST, which was like the shape and the profile is fantastic. Let's use that mold. Let's lighten it up, switch out the wood core for a lighter mixed wood core. And that's what is the biggest reducer of weight for this touring, the Echo 106. Um, and we've switched the carbon flax inlay to basalt. Hmm. Just a little change there. But we maintain like our key tech in it, which is the cork amplifier and the tip and tail, mm -hmm. which is the double side wall, still full wood core. So it still has the ski ability and like the trust, the fun side of it. We've just lightened it up so it goes uphill a little better. That's really cool. Yeah. I mean, I think like, I don't know, it seems, I guess, A, in, in snowboarding, I feel like there's a lot of room for, for growth because it's just, and I imagine it's the same thing in skiing too, is that my, especially my like split board touring setup feels really different Yeah. in a, in almost a sometimes frustrating way where yeah. it's just like, or like th you, they've gotten you lose better. Confidence. Yeah. You lose confidence, maybe in a confidence lacking way, yeah. is a <laughs> nice way to put it. But like, and granted, like things have come so far in that touring arena but like you know I still it still feels like we're kind of in an earlier stage of figuring out how to like blend the the needs and still keep you know the ski tech ski technology which has been evolving for decades now it just has such a head start compared to like the touring space yeah yeah the pendulum kind of goes uh -huh. maybe too far or not there's also just different practices of touring, right? Like what totally. is touring? Yeah. And like, what does it mean to you? Right. You kind yeah. of go back to that, like, okay, well, who is this for? Exactly. You know, because there's, um, you have like the DeRay brothers who are just like lightest, fastest uphill possible yeah. equipment. Like yeah, I don't we have care like, what going downhill looks like. <laughs> yeah. And like schemo is like this yeah. new growing sport, especially in Europe. And like, it was, it's just about like speed as fast up as possible, which means light. And then like hack your way down. Like it's not pretty skiing. <laughs> uh, no offense to ski mo skiers. Like they're definitely great skiers. Yeah. But once they get on ski mo skis, they're so light and skinny. Like yeah. they're not skiing to their full downhill potential. Totally. So yeah, that's the beauty of this, this Echo 106 is it like does both so well. We've found a nice middle point for 
those skiers who are going into the backcountry to like reach new areas, new heights, to ski new lines that are like still serious skiing. There yeah. may be, of course, like Cody's still a peak bagger, right? Yeah. Um, but that's not really like we know that not all consumers who are peak baggers are focused as much on the downhill as like Cody is. So mm-hmm. we co-developed this with him and it's what he's been skiing on for a couple of years now. Cool. So that's sick. Have yeah. you, so you've probably skied on it then too? Yeah. I skied on it quite a bit last year. Nice. Yeah. And what's your like go-to kind of setup then? For skis? Yeah. Well, yeah, like around here locally in last Utah. Last winter. Like, yeah. Last winter. Was maybe an anomaly. Hopefully not. Hopefully, hopefully it was not. not big yeah, year. hopefully it's but a new norm. <laughs> I skied on the QST blank 178 a lot of the year. Yeah. And then if it's not like super fresh power, if it's maybe 12 inches or under, 10 inch or under, I like I'll ski the the 106 in 181. And then when I go in the backcountry, I take my QST Echo 106, I go down to 173 just to be more maneuverable. Kick turns are hard (laughs) with the 181. I'm not that tall. Yeah. My legs aren't very long. So yeah, then I switch it up, go with the Echo. But I, it's so nice, like you said, to, I know the shape, I know how this ski is going to feel underfoot. So when I drop into some line, that's like maybe not the prettiest snow at the top or whatever it is, you don't know what's under there. I still have that confidence. I'm not like, oh man, I'm on this like super light squirrely ski. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Am I going to die? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Am I going to bag right now? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so how, I mean, like how many, this is actually, I'm just like curious because over the last few years, I feel like I keep, it, I'm not trying to, but my like snowboarding quiver keeps expanding. And maybe that's yeah. just because I'm like getting more specific about what I'm riding. Like what's your... How many like pieces are in your quiver? Like how many different types of skis do you think you'll cycle through in a year? That's, I feel like that's a little bit unfair to ask because part of my job is to like test skis, right? So I'm always getting stuff to Uh, try. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But (laughs) I don't know, like your ideal. Yeah, Yeah. so if I have to simplify it and I had to buy one pair of skis next year, like if for some reason I no longer worked as Allman, don't have that hook up anymore, whatever. I'm going to buy a QST 106. Mm, mm-hmm. It's all around. I can still, like you could ski 20 inches a pound and still have like such a good day Yeah. on that ski. Or it can, it can not snow for a month of January, which also happens here mm-hmm. <laughs> and still have so much fun, like ripping on the Cirque and be confident on that. And you could put a shift binding on it with a 106 and like do everything. Yeah. 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 Dang, that's cool. Yeah. Okay. And then I also am curious about Boa ski boots because that like Boa has been in snowboard boots for a really long time. Yeah. And it'll be cool to kind of get your perspective on this because from my understanding, it's like the shell has kind and trying to figure out how to like work with the shell of a ski boot versus that of a snowboard boot. That's kind of like led more design constraints to get a good Boa ski boot developed. Is that kind of, was that like the case? Yeah, it took a long time to develop the S Pro Super Boa. Mm-hmm. Is that is that what this one is? Yeah, that's okay, this cool. boot. We here we go. Sure. Mm-hmm. In the development process, you know, of course, like step one is like, what what does this boa do? What's the point of it? Why? And pretty quickly, you realize like, okay, it's a more consistent wrapping of the foot and you can also micro adjust it more than a buckle or more than majority of skiers micro adjust their buckles. And then the next thing we learned quite quickly is like, you can't just throw this BOA system onto a traditional four buckle boot shell. Mm -hmm. So like the thickness of the plastic in different areas of the shell was designed previously of where the buckles are and how they clamp and you got to reinforce the shell in certain places to try to smooth out that pressure essentially of where yeah. this metal buckle is now clamping on your instep. Yeah. And it's a completely different, you know, tension system and where and how it's pulling and wrapping. So we hmm. redesigned that shell from the ground up 
to fully harness a boa. That's pretty wild. Yeah. So it's very different than snowboard boots. Yeah. Um, I don't know how long it took to first develop a boa on a snowboard boot, but I, feel I know like this it was, took a long time. Yeah. I think boa and snowboarding was a pretty run and gun effort. Like yeah. I, I remember the earlier boa boots and I hadn't tried it until more recently, but yeah, the earlier ones, it would, there's a lot of malfunctioning and like kind of a lot of cons and, you know, plenty of pros too, as far as the efficiency goes. But yeah, I don't know. I, I was talking with someone recently about trying to figure out how, you know, like doing the development process of getting a bow on a ski boot, because yeah, it's like a, a shell on a ski boot is so rigid and stiff like your material that you're trying to move around you know you, you look at a ski boot and they have these like robust huge buckles and then yeah boas will i've had them you know break on like a small piece of fabric right so like figuring out a robust enough system mm -hmm. that still like tightens properly yeah is, I mean, you know, it's no small feat and the development of the the dial and everything like that was for sure more on, on BOA, but like we worked closely with them from an early stage of raising those concerns because everyone in this industry has seen, you know, what happened when they first entered into snowboard and, and BOA themselves from the beginning were like, we have one chance to enter alpine skiing. We, we can't screw this up. So it is way stronger than the small boa systems that are on a lot of snowboard boots or like your cycling shoes i mean the cable itself is like way thicker yeah the cable looks like the size of like something i've seen like a piece of climbing equipment yeah and the the housing of it obviously has to be bigger to house that bigger cable and longer cable because we need more play in the system and we had a display at one of the meetings of like the boa dial with the cable hanging with like a big block of weights on it and you could like dial the boa and like lift this weight up and that's when you like start to realize like whoa this thing's strong it's a good demonstration <laughs> shout out to the person who decided to yeah. do that setup yeah i don't know who made that <laughs> killer sales pitch <laughs> <laughs> oh man well that's awesome that's that's like cool kind of getting to pick your brains about all the products and all those things and like it's kind of sick seeing you know especially I, c I can relate to this too with your like technical background getting so immersed in the sport and mm -hmm. and then being able to apply that in a more broad broad scale uh is really cool to kind of hear how you've gone about doing that and you know we're sort of getting to the end of this thing and getting ready to wrap it up and i was just curious what do you what do you got on the radar what else do you got going on and <sighs> what's the next little future looking like oh winter Looks like winter, hopefully soon, <laughs> which is fun. Um, I'm excited for that. I don't know. What else do I have going on? I do some things outside of work. I've, I spend some time volunteering. I Where my passion, one of my passions lies is uh, with increasing diversity on, on slopes. So I volunteer with National Brotherhood of Snow Sports, and I help run the Olympic Scholarship Fund. That's pretty cool and um rewarding at times and hard work sometimes too but it's a volunteer thing and yeah I, I like doing that and I mountain bike a lot too so. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome man that's that's really cool you're kind of getting involved in uh and trying to you know give back in other ways mm -hmm. it's super special sweet well um thank you so much this thank has been you. awesome did you have any thank yous you wanted to toss out is it bad if I say no? <laughs> no, just kidding. No. Um, I'd like to thank myself for being here today. <laughs> no, there's so many people to thank to like help me get here. And <clears throat> obviously my parents, like it's crazy to be back at, back at Salmon. And like you said, it's kind of a multi-generational thing and it's pretty cool to, to get to represent this brand in another way other than just a, not just, but I'm working on product, doing cool things. So lots of mentors in my life who've helped me at different phases and yeah. And then for sure, hands down, like thanks to Solomon. Yeah. Pretty, yeah. I feel pretty lucky and grateful to be here and work for an amazing brand that I, that I love. So yeah. That's great. <laughs> well said. Well, again, thank you. 
thoroughly enjoyed this. Yeah. It's been a good conversation. <laughs> and thank you to everyone who tuned in. Hopefully you liked the episode. If you did, make sure to comment, like, and subscribe. And in the meantime, from the crew at Backcountry, we will see you out there. See ya. <laughs>